Now we turn to Gail Whiteman, who comes to us via the University of Exeter in the UK, though she's originally from Canada. As Professor of Sustainability at Exeter, her focus is on the risks to society and to economies that will emerge from climate change. Economies are human relationships, of course, and systems of livelihoods and resource allocation. Committed to getting global business leaders really involved to achieve sustainable science-based targets for development, she's founded what's called Arctic Base Camp to educate the very powerful and influential attendees who go to Davos, the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Actually, I would say that the Camden Conference people, you are more influential, but they're fairly influential. Today, Dr. Whiteman addresses corporate engagement in the future of the Arctic, it's entitled, What Happens in the Arctic Does Not Stay There, the Arctic as a Barometer of Global Risk. Dr. Whiten. Thank you so much, David. And thank you, Fran and Ulf, for setting the stage. And it's an honor to be at the Camden Conference, which I've actually heard quite a lot about. A former colleague of mine, Professor George Yip, is a previous speaker. So I'm sorry not to be there in Maine in person. But it's a delight to still be here. Um, as David said, the work I do is I try to brief um, uh, powerful uh, decision makers on global risk. And, and to start that off, I, I try to show uh, images like this one, where to me, this is one of the most frightening uh, 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 sort of illustrations of, of global risk. And, and, and what is it? Well, it's actually Arctic summer sea ice, and that only is going up to 2000 there. And we know certainly the ice has continued, continued to melt. And, and the reason why that is one of the most uh, frightening um, uh, 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 trends is, is because of the way the Arctic is connected with the rest of the world. Certainly it's bad news uh, for many in the Arctic, which Fran uh, went through in great detail in her presentation. So I will not repeat that, but I do think it's important to really put any discussions around development development of the Arctic in terms of a global uh, context and really looking at what are the global economic risks that come from the changing Arctic. So lots of discussions internationally about the Arctic tend to happen within the Arctic itself or within the Arctic circle, let's say. So Arctic countries like talking about the Arctic and certainly figuring out the best way to sustainably develop it. In addition, many other countries around the world are trying to get in and become observers of these discussions. And there's lots of reasons why they want to do that. Potentially, a lot of that has to do with how they want to get a piece of the pie of the natural resources that the Arctic, of course, happens has. In addition, though, I think there's been an increasing awareness that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there and it affects the rest of us. Now, scientists studying the Arctic have been worried for a long time. And since the, the 1970s, we have known that the Arctic Ocean is really in crisis. There's been a 50% reduction in the thickness of sea ice since the 70s, 50% area loss, 75% volume loss, and multi-year uh, ice has really declined rapidly, and there's been a 95% loss since 1985. And if you see the Arctic and you position it as one of the world's best insurance policies against runaway climate change, we can see with these figures that our insurance policy is in trouble. And that's the message that I try to take to world leaders. Now, Many scientists have been worried about the Arctic for a long time, but these are the temperatures in the Arctic last summer, 2020, when most of us were still locked down from the current pandemic. And we can see that it was absolutely raging. Um, temperature records were, were, were um, broken massively. Uh, parts of Russia in Siberia, they were at 38 degrees Celsius. That's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 40 degrees warmer than the average temperature would normally be. Of course, there were wild fires that raged throughout the Arctic, and they released a ton of carbon um, record-breaking uh, amounts and record-breaking pollution levels, which of course accelerate the melt because of the, the small part particles that go on uh, the white ice and, and snow. So, so you can see that, that the Arctic was certainly in, in, in trouble in terms of temperature and fires, and, and here's an example of the Siberian fires here. Greenland in 2019 had astronomical temperatures as well. We saw 
<laughs> huge amounts and melt happening in June. Um, and it, while we didn't have quite as much melt in, in 2020, we could see that there was still really big changes happening. And, and uh, large parts of the ice sheet did, did collapse, one of them being almost the size of Paris. So that was huge. In Canada, which is my home country, um, the 4,000-year-old ice uh, uh, um, 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 ice shelf, the Milne Glacier broke off, and that was Canada's last remaining one. So, so big changes there. And of course, the summer sea ice went to the second lowest ever, and we did not have any extreme weather events happening uh, in terms of superstorms. So that was incredibly, incredibly concerning. Now, we do know that those changes poses, uh, 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 you know, significant issues. This is a photo from Greenland of what looks like uh, 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 Greenland sled dogs uh, walking on water and of course it's just showing that how this melt is happening in different places than it normally would happen. We also see though that the Arctic's becoming green and this is a, a image from NASA which just shows how green parts of it are becoming which again when hey, you... Gail, uh, this is David, I'm just going to interrupt. Your slides actually aren't visible so let's pause for just a second I'll let you put those in. The slides are not visible. I'm yeah. sharing my slides. Are you sharing? And uh... Yeah. I started sharing at the beginning. Let's see here. We're gonna just uh, we're gonna get to the bottom of this in two seconds because we're loving what you're hearing, but it'd be better to see the picture. Yeah, you're missing all my beautiful. Photos. Here they are. Here they are. Okay, I'll get out of the way now. Can you see it now? We sure can, and I'll get out of the way. Okay, well that's good. So let me see. I got to I've got to play it. So hang on a second. I've got to get it back to the play um, side. I cannot see the screen to share it. Sorry. Um, there, now I'm sharing it. Okay, so this is what the green Arctic looks like. So we can see that there's tons of green spots and, and this is concerning from a, a science perspective because the white, whether it's snow or ice, that reflects 80% of the sunlight back out to space. And when it's green, that insurance policy is gone. So it's a big massive shift that we are seeing in terms of the changes in the ecology. We're also seeing more and more methane. That's a concern. We really don't know how much of the subsea uh, uh, methane there is, um, especially in the East Siberian Sea, but we're seeing it increasingly bubbling up in lakes and also some of the big methane bursts that are, are happening on land with craters. So when I talk about should the Arctic be developed uh, or not, especially with extractive in industries, I say that there's five ways that the Arctic affects global risk and especially global economic risk here. And it's important to balance that and really have a bit of a wake up call on this. Now, everybody always talks about shipping and the economic ben benefits from shipping. And it's true, of course, given that it's a shorter route, there definitely could be some economic uh, um, uh, benefits. And there could be some CO2 emissions if the shipping is actually a shorter. But there's also economic studies showing that Arctic shipping, as it increases over time, so does the black carbon and other short-lived pollutants that come from those ships. And if you estimate those using economic models of climate change, that could be up to 10 trillion uh, US dollars in terms of climate impacts globally. The problem is those that will get economic benefits from shipping directly are not the ones that are going to pay the price of those increased economic um, impacts globally. Largely, those will be countries that are already being affected by climate change, low-lying uh, low island states, um, Asia, India, parts of China, Bangladesh. They will actually pick up the price tag of increased things like Arctic shipping, and they're certainly unlikely, except perhaps for China and India, to get a lot of the benefits. So we've got to really balance those things in a global setting somehow. In addition, though, the Arctic doesn't just affect um, parts of it, it affects the rest of the world. So it accelerates massively climate change costs elsewhere. A study has looked at what's the cost of, of the Arctic's melting permafrost, if it, if it does thaw in the future, and estimates of that are up to 70 trillion US dollars over the long term, which is tremendously big. That's the size of pretty much the world economy as it stands now. Now, it's not an annual cost. Uh, uh, it's an overall cost in a net present value form, but it's a big ticket item. And again, we've got to really see, does it make sense to actually take out more oil and gas, which is the fossil fuel that's driving the changes in the Arctic and actually take a look at the cost that we're going to incur it by, do, by doing so. Extreme weather, though, is not just happening in the Arctic, 
But but researchers like Jennifer Francis, which Fran also talked about, are showing increasingly that there's links for the rest of the mid latitudes, especially on our extreme weather, and that's related back to the Arctic change. So if you're in if you were in California or the west coast of the U.S. last year, there's no question you were choking on uh, um, on the air. The the wildfires were raging. It was unbelievable uh, all the way down. You could you could you know smell it, taste it in L.A. And we can see that on the East Coast, there was also, again, this increase in hurricane trajectory, and those superstorms are hanging around longer, and they're just battering, battering. And these are all linked to Arctic change. So what we've got is we've got these extreme weather situations, and they're related to that, and the costs of those do come back to the loss of summer sea ice. We also see the polar vortex, which Fran also talked about, and what we're seeing in Texas, and there's costs on that, and it's not just in the U.S. If we take a look at um, one of the large insurance companies, reinsurance companies, Munich Re, they are very interested in the number of loss events and the number, of course, of, of of insured losses, so the assets that are in trouble. And we can see steadily that amount has gone up. There's more and more extreme weather. Not all of this is Arctic related, but there's no question that the Arctic is adding into it and it's extremely expensive. So the cost of that and the cost of not keeping the Arctic sea ice uh, over the summer will add to these costs as well. Sea level rise, of course, we know that Greenland is melting. Certainly, it's no longer in balance. And we can see that the sea level risk to the world's uh, 20 top cities, both in terms of population exposed and asset exposed, is extreme. In terms of uh, the, the top, uh, say, it takes top five of, of populations uh, with large cities, um, we can see those are largely Asian-based. The first one we get uh, down to is, um, uh, uh, you know, we've got New York and um, uh, Miami. But in terms of asset exposed, the top Three, in the top three, you've got two U.S. cities. So it, again, is very expensive. And if we start to lose more of Greenland, uh, which is contributing to sea level rise, that's where we're going to feel it. We're going to feel it in those coastal cities, both in terms of population at risk and in terms of assets at risk. And we can see that the potential of flood-related damage in terms of the worst is, 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 is all around the world. U.S. number one in terms of potential flood-related damage. And then that will include China, it will include Europe, India, um, other parts of Asia, and also Brazil. So expensive stuff happening all around related back to the Arctic as well. One of the things that a number of the business executives that I talk to don't always understand is that because the Arctic so is so such a big impact on the global climate system and affects extreme weather around the world, especially mid latitudes here. That that what happens in the Arctic is important for the CEOs of major food companies and agricultural companies, because as the Arctic changes, we're going to see more extreme weather and we're going to have a food security risks increase as well as water security. So that's another way we can look at development. So who is responsible? Well, the big emitters are responsible. There's a direct relationship that research has shown that the amount of emissions each country has per year directly relates to Arctic sea ice loss. So just looking at 2017, a little bit old data here, but still the U.S. in terms of the emissions, they, they melted more than 90 times the size of Washington, D.C. in terms of Arctic summer sea ice. The EU, 100 times the size of Paris. China, over 10 times the size of Hong Kong or, or the size of the country of Belgium. And India, of course, five times the size of Delhi. So it does mean that, that actually what you're doing in each of these individual big emitters directly comes back to the, to the fate of the Arctic, which then affects risk everywhere else. So the best way, I think, if we're going to have a sustainable Arctic is we've got to get as close to the 1.5 uh, C target in terms of additional warming, warning as possible. Because anything above the 1.5, we can see from IPCC data, uh, is that the Arctic region becomes quickly in, in trouble. And it's just one of the things, along with the, the, the freshwater coral, um, that, that is affected so quickly from small temperature rises. So the best way to save the Arctic is to cut CO2 emissions. Now that means big changes. Uh, it really means by cutting emissions in half by 2030 and getting to net zero by 2050, which is a massive 
massive undertaking. And that kind of undertaking cannot, absolutely cannot have additional Arctic oil and gas drilling extraction. It just can't. Anything that does that is not following the science. It's actually following short-term economic gains for some and letting the rest of the world pick up the price tag. The last point that I want to make is that the pandemic has been a sobering reality check for all of us. Um, I've been locked down for a long time, and I must say that it has been personally challenging and also a lot of growth. We've seen the world come together. We've seen world governments put humanity above the economy. And now what we need to make sure is that as we build those economic recovery plans from COVID, we have to make sure that those are low carbon compliant. The trillions of dollars that are going to be pushed into infrastructure, various forms of economic recovery, if they are not low carbon compliant, we can really, really probably say goodbye to the Arctic summer sea ice, which will pose economic risks and social risk for us well into the future. So on that note, what I'm, I, I would like to close with is a little bit of hope that I'd have to say that I am more hopeful now than I have been for the last five years. And that's not because the Arctic is any health, in any healthier state, but it's because I can see that when the humanity works together, we can actually tackle tremendous changes and we've done that with the pandemic, and we're certainly getting our way out of that. And I think we can do that with the Arctic as well. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Gail. This is incredible. All right, now it's the question and answer session for the three wonderful people we've been talking to. Uh, we've got a few uh, excellent questions here. All the questions that we've gotten are excellent. I'd like to see some more. Uh, send them in to that email address. And also, if you can, include your uh, hometown. That would be fun as well. Again, I just want to follow up with you on a couple things uh, I think people want to know just a tiny bit more about. We don't have to get too deeply in the weeds. But when you talked about sort of the messiness of the increased sea routes, you, know, you talked about like soot, and you think of, okay, particulate pollution. But it's more complicated than that, right? Because the soot yep. falls on white ice. Exactly. And, and could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, you know, soot is never good, right? You know, you never want to breathe that in directly. It's always got some problems to it. Um, but, but in addition, when you've got actually um, soot being uh, spewed out onto the white, it changes the albedo. So it attracts the sunlight and it makes that ice just melt a bit more. So it amplifies whatever melt there would have been on that ice faster. And, and that's, the, that's the concern that unless there's really uh, some really strong, I think, um, rules about the type of, uh, of fuel and certainly not um, heavy fuel oil, um, then what we're gonna do is we just think that we're just traveling by sh you know ship, but actually what we're doing is we're speeding up the loss of that ice and that's just really problematic. Another quick follow-up to, uh, to, to something that you said. You had this extraordinary number for the cost of the loss of permafrost. It was like yeah. 70 trillion with a T, yeah. I think. Uh, explain that just a touch, because you didn't say ice, you said permafrost. Uh, yeah. Why is that so expensive when we lose it? Yeah, so permafrost is um, uh, well. It's 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 a it, it's a type of uh, a, a greenhouse gas uh, has got, hoses uh, methane, and uh, a CH four is in the permafrost, and so when that thaws, it releases it. Now, it it doesn't last as long in the atmosphere as as, as C, uh, CO two, but what it does is it's much more potent. It's like 20, 25, uh, 24 times more potent, so it actually amplifies warming. Uh, in a, a, a shorter time frame, but really intensely. And there's so much of it. There's so much of it based on land, through Siberia, through Canada. But then there's also the concern, and here's there's not quite enough data. It's the you know subsea um, uh, uh, methane in the East Siberian Sea. There's just simply not enough data uh, that we have to really understand how much of that is there and how much of that is destabilizing. Certainly some of the Russian scientists are raising really concerning warning signs about it. But again, I think it's something that just needs uh, needs more data. But the stuff we know about on land is really, it's really is really problematic if it if it indeed is thaws. I started out with brunette hair, but hearing this, I'm, <laughs> yeah, that's me. I'm Doctor Doom and Gloom, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I would say well, this one sounds like it's really directed to Ulf, Doctor Svedrup, but others can weigh in also after you, Ulf. Um, it's from Ruth in Parkman, Maine. Given the aggressive rhetoric that's been used by Russia in the Arctic, how can 
uh, we prevent the Arctic from becoming an arena for systematic military competition, is how she put it. Okay. Um, I think that many countries have raised their rhetoric. Uh, Russia certainly have done that. Uh, but at the same time, it's fair to say that Russia also has some legitimate interests in the Arctic. Um, I think the most single most important thing to do is um, to take into account that countries will increase their exercises, military presence and exercises in the region. They will build more capabilities and we have to prepare ourselves for that. Uh, probably the single most important thing to do is to make sure that these exercises are ending up as exercises and only that. Because when countries exercise, they have to give some share information, be transparent, uh, try to say something about the capacities they want to use, notify about the timing of the, those exercises to, uh, to make the rest of us uh, less anxious. Because uh, I think uh, the response time and uh, the dynamics in the security community is rapidly changing. So, uh, for instance, if one country exercises and use offensive instruments in that, the other countries have to respond very rapidly. And uh, we have seen too many of these near accidents where you could have triggered escalatory dynamics and everything spun out of control very rapidly. So I think the single most important thing is to make clear rules for exercising and stick to those norms. So exchange information and develop good protocols. So what we are doing now at OR Institute together with uh, some of our colleagues in the US, is basically to try to create a database of all exercises. And what we have seen is that uh, both uh, on the NATO side and on the Russian side, it's unclear procedures uh, for exchange of information. So, uh, so we hope that some of the results from our research will, will map out a bit better and start a dialogue between Russia and NATO on how to improve the exchange of information. So I think that's the most important thing. The next question, I'm gonna start with Fran, cause she has uh, some direct experience, but I think we'll come back to Ulf. Um, it's from what looks like uh, Adria, Adria Bates, Darien, Connecticut. Military aside, how actually strong are the Arctic Circle, United Nations governance, other multilateral frameworks uh, versus superpower ambitions. Do these institutions, which by the way, Ulf said we need to, you know, keep, they need to keep at their boring work. Uh, can they enforce, you know, fighting climate and economic transgressions? What do you think, Fran? The short answer is no, mm. they cannot enforce. I mean, let's, let's take the Arctic Council as an example. It's an intergovernmental forum. It is not a treaty-based organization, so it doesn't have legal power. It has convening power, and it has the opportunity to create a space where the Arctic nations can see what they have in common, whether that's sustainable development or environmental protection, and work together. And it also creates an opportunity for more of the kind of um, dialogue that illustrates why remaining as a relatively conflict-free area is in everybody's best interest. And let me just frame that in terms of what we've been discussing, which is Russia, whether or not it escalates or de-escalates. In a way, you can make the case not only does it make sense for Russia to be expanding its infrastructure and capacity in the north when you look at a globe and realize how much of the Arctic is Russian territory? But it is in their best interest to project more of an image of 
uh, a responsible international player in the Arctic. Why? Because they're trying to promote the Northern Sea Route. They're trying to promote additional investment in their infrastructure for oil and gas, for example. And it's a lot easier to attract investors and other countries to cooperate with them in an area that's very important to them economically, their oil and gas resources, if they are behaving well. So it's, it's a tension, I think, within Russia between building up their military prowess and looking tough and protecting their space, but also being a responsible international player. And I will note that Russia and the United States, for example, recently uh, strengthened their bilateral agreement on how to respond to an emergency in the Arctic, uh, how to respond to oil spills in the Arctic. Uh, the U.S. and Russia recently re-upped their agreement on how to have this corridor of transport through the Bering Strait, an agreement on, on routes. So, I mean, there's a lot of examples, but in terms of an overarching entity, that would somehow manage the governance in this space? No, as, as was said by President Grimson, the national territorial responsibilities and national governance capacity and prerogatives mean that there really isn't going to be some sort of a, an agreement for everything. There will be pieces of the puzzle, whether it's search and rescue and response or scientific cooperation or like the new Central Arctic fishing uh, moratorium. There will be pieces of the puzzle, but not an overarching and all controlling international entity. Well, Svejov, what, what are your thoughts about this? I mean, do these, when you get outside the superpower power, uh, do these other organizations that seem well-intentioned, uh, do they have much power to push back? Uh, no, uh, no, I, I agree. So, first of all, the Arctic Council, for instance, they don't discuss security issues at all in that. So, so, so that's a deliberate choice to take that out of the agenda. So, and Russia, for instance, has also been concerned that NATO should have an Arctic policy. Basically, the Russia is also interested in keeping all this out. So, basically, saying that this should be kept for the states. Now, I think that. Uh, the most important or mo one of the most demanding developments in terms of security, and I think also the Icelandic president alluded to this, is the fact that geopolitical rivalry and tensions in other parts of the world might spill over to the cooperation or the, the spirit of cooperation in the Arctic. So uh, if you remember back in the time when you had this tension in, in 2008, uh, uh, the annexation in Georgia. Uh, that never led to kind of changed cooperation between the US and the European countries in the Arctic. Now, if you go to uh, the Crimea crisis, that changed the dynamic in the Arctic. So there we saw a much stronger spillover from tensions elsewhere into the the, the cooperation in the Arctic. And now uh, we are faced with a very different geopolitical situation where the US and maybe also Europe is in a long-term strategic rivalry with China in particular. And, uh, uh, and China uh, is uh, a country that is uh, invested and developing its co cooperation with Russia. And uh, Russia needs Russian cooperation in order to extract and benefit from its resources. So, so they want to use, turn to Asia as its market, but also need access to technology and investments from China. So, and this creates some big difficulties. Of course, it creates big difficulties for Russia because Russia don't want to be captured by China and they don't want to kind of negotiate with China in a position for, of weakness. But for, for the US and for the Europeans, this creates a bit of difficulties. So I think that one of the big issues as we go along would be to see how Europe, how the US, Canada relates to Russia as we go along and, uh, and uh, not only think about 
seeing the Arctic as a as an arena, another arena for rivalry with China. I think so. That's a that's a big issue. It's it's it would be certainly demanding. And here, going back to uh, Secretary Pompeo's speech in the Arctic Council, I think that some of the interpretation of that speech in Europe was at least that basically he argued for a position of U.S. Want, wanting to confront China also in the Arctic. So when he looked at the Arctic, he basically saw the South China Sea again. And I think that that was uh, maybe slightly misleading. Um, and, uh, and relating to the, uh, to the sea route, uh, the U.S. has also announced that they want to have freedom of navigation operations in the Arctic. Uh, and, and this is a contested issue, as seen from the Russians. So that's another topic that I think uh, could be contested. So, so it's a bit chaotic, maybe, my remarks. But I think that it's important for the U.S. and for Europeans to find some way of talking to the Russians uh, in dealing with the Arctic. You cannot, you cannot have a proper governance in the Arctic without engaging with the Russians. It's not going to be easy, but you cannot ignore that. I didn't see a uh, sharp difference of opinion on this, the three people here in this panel, but there was a sharp difference of opinion uh, between someone on this panel and someone earlier in the day. And a lot of people are commenting on this. So let me just bring this up again. Um, here's how it was phrased by Caitlin, a University of Cambridge student in, in the UK. Earlier in the conference, President Grimson spoke about not stopping liquefied natural gas extraction in Russia and Arctic areas. In contrast, Dr. Whiteman spoke of it needs to stop, uh, essentially. How do we reconcile this? Because it's also a metaphor for development in general. Uh, uh, Fran Elmer was talking about um, you know, uh, development, but doing it right. Uh, the fact that uh, that there is an there can be an inherent conflict between more extraction and more economic activity and dealing with the pressing environmental problem. Um, I don't know who wants to start this. I'll start you with Fran, but uh, probably Dr. Whiteman, you want to get involved. Well, as we know, countries don't tend to decide whether or not particular economic development projects go forward in the global context of what's good for the planet, right? I mean, it's a sad statement about humanity that we can't think more globally, but you know, a country, whether it's Alaska, you know, deciding whether it wants to do more oil and gas or Russia or Norway or anybody else, tends to look at it more narrowly than what's in the best interests of all of humanity. So when it comes to whether or not there will be more natural gas, more LNG shipped out of Russia or not, it will be a combination of what Russia decides, what economics tell us in terms of price and other sources that may be available for a product that is in demand, right? So it is demand driven as long as people want to drive cars and until we all drive electric vehicles, uh, we'll probably want to pump more oil, right, from someplace. The question is from where? I agree with Gail that there are additional considerations in terms of where oil and gas comes from, who's doing the developing, what the environmental standards are, uh, what the cost of development is, what the spin-off either benefits or, or damages to the relevant communities and the people nearby. All of those things are legitimate things that should be factored in. But unfortunately, it's kind of not the way economic decisions about development get made. What is being said, I think, by all of us on this panel is that we need a much greater awareness by governments, by the public, in terms of the kind of policies that are adopted by governments, whether they're in the Arctic or anywhere, that drive us toward a low carbon future. That is essential for a sustainable Arctic. It's essential for a sustainable planet. And whatever anyone can do in whatever role they play, 
uh, in business, in government, in academia, in NGOs. We all have to be pushing in that direction in whatever way we can. Um, thanks, Fran. I'd like to add it in on this. And, and I, all I can say is that physics doesn't lie. Um, if we had 200 years, we could sort of nicely um, uh, move, you know, sort of easily towards a low carbon society, but the window's closing and it's closing rapidly. So it's a wake up call that we have to get to 1.5. And if we don't stay at the 1.5 C warmer window, and we're already over one degree warmer now, then we will likely lose the Arctic summer sea ice, which is what our big insurance policy, or certainly one of them against catastrophic runaway climate change. So um, the real that's the reality, I can't change that. Um, and, and I think that the, the science-based uh, uh, decision-making uh, needs to take uh, uh, that very closely. And it's true, of course, that's part of the problem with the way we've set up the governance of the world is that we weren't so interconnected before. Uh, you know, nation states were able to make, and rightly so, their own decisions. But as we've seen with the pandemic, it's not so easy that actually decisions other countries make, especially if what they do affects us, we kind of got to get involved somehow. The question is how, and maybe Ulf knows how to do the how. I don't, I'm just ringing that bell saying, this is a problem. And, and I'm very happy to report that big business, big banks are agreeing with me. So there, there is a Bank of America, Citibank, BNP Paribas, which is a large French multinational. Many of the major banks are saying they will not finance new oil and gas extraction in the Arctic. They're just not gonna do it. You know, and I think that is a recognition that if the, we don't stay to the 1.5 as close as possible, or certainly below the two degrees warmer world, um, the price tag is, is a bad one. So the global financial community recognizes that, and it's not just a, a moral response from them, it's really a financial one, and it poses significant governance challenges. Um, that's, uh, you know, that, that would be Fran and Ulf's area. All I can say is, you know, that's the reality check. Um, Science-based uh, decision-making would say no new oil and gas development in the Arctic. That's all I can maybe, read. Uh, I suppose it may be the case. I, Go ahead, please, Ulf. Uh, can I toss in? I think that there, that's a simple, simple solution to this, uh, and it's, it's a carbon price. Carbon price. So you need to bring up the carbon price, and then the market will fix it, because uh, that will drive uh, uh, consumers. Uh, into other sources of energy. So I think that's the big global issue. Now, I, I agree with, of course, with what we have heard from some of the others in the panel now. And uh, uh, financial institutions uh, basically pushing companies to disclose, disclose their, their, their carbon risk exposure and the, the risk of stranded assets in their holdings. That is also driving up uh, uh, <clears throat> or, or driving companies out of investing in oil and gas. So I think that, that the markets are functioning. Now, I have only one disagreement with what you heard from Gail here. I think that it's not evident, also from what we've heard from, uh, from the other speakers, that Arctic drilling in itself is worse than drilling elsewhere, uh, drilling for oil elsewhere. Yeah, it, and, uh, it, 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 there could be some soft problems and there could be some other things. But I, in some sense, uh, in the global uh, calculus, we have to think about, is it so that maybe liquefied natural gas coming out of Russia or else, is it different from coal being produced in the US or China? So, so, so we have to think about it in this global uh, 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 way of thinking, uh, taking the CO2 emissions, uh, mass and gas and other things in, in, into account when, when we calculate. So I agree fully with what you're saying, that the global financial institutions would be coming increasingly reluctant to, f uh, to finance uh, oil and gas extraction. Uh, I don't see it as only being limited to the Arctic, but I well, think in general. In the financial community, there's definitely a, a, a explicit, explicit moratorium from financing Arctic-based oil and gas development by a number of the big banks, and not just 
you know, five of them, but many of them. And there are real concerns about that. So uh, the, the bottom line is, is that we have to half emissions by 2030. So any decisions uh, made on any new uh, fossil fuel developments has to take that into account. And I, I'm just not seeing a lot of that with what Gazprom is, is, is saying. Mm. Yeah, but I agree on that, and 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 and, and that that this is a general development, and that's what I said also on, on. And to my knowledge, I'm not working in an energy company, so. But what I understand from from for, for the Norwegian continental shelf, uh, I see the very much reduced interest from companies in trying to develop oil and gas in the Arctic. Uh, it's it's costly. It's risky. Uh, reputational uh, damage. In addition, it's very far away from the infrastructure, so so it makes it very expensive to bring it to the market. Now, on the Russian and side, it's slightly very, different. And bringing, but 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 it's not Russia's not doing their development alone. They're also looking at how they get investment from, say, France to do so. So French government is looking to fund that liquid uh, uh, natural gas development. And and then you have to say to President Macron, um, really, or is it make um, uh, the planet great again if you are investing uh, 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 French uh, uh, taxpayers' monies in this way? So it's a system, and you kind of can't have your cake and eat it too with this system at the point at which we're at. So it's certainly not Russia alone here. That That is also important to see that there is there. it's an interconnected uh, web, not just in terms of consuming the energy, it's financing the energy as well. And in some of the countries that look really good, I mean, Norway always looks really good on a number of, of things like the um, electric vehicle um, subsidies and the boom in EVs. But still, there's a, you know, there's a tremendous amount of, 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 of development and the WWF report looking at all of the articles countries only found Sweden actually as having the green report card. The rest, including my home country of Canada, um, had a lot of questions about it, as did, of course, all the rest, US, Norway, um, uh, and so on, Russia as well. So I, I think the point here is it's interconnected, but we're going to have tough choices to make. And we can't just say sustainable development and think that that means something. We really have to have action. All right. We're, we're going to leave it right there because we're going to go to lunch now. But um... Uh, we had some great questions we didn't get to. We're going to keep the questions. I'm going to print them out because um, we have all the panelists back later, but also some seem relevant to other parts of the conference as well. They're terrific questions. Please keep them coming. So uh, let's say thank you to Francis Ulmer, Ulf Svezrup, and Gail Whiteman for this incredible panel. Oh, my goodness, we could just keep talking all afternoon, all of us.